Okay, class, uh, lecture number 19. Last time we were together, I think we mentioned it about canals. We don't see much in the way of canals today, but uh, at that time in the 1820s, 1830s, there were a number of those. We also mentioned railroads and the uh, proliferation of railroad miles. And as I told you the other day, by the time we get into 1900, the number of railroad miles across the country will be 220,000 miles there. All right, we also talked about the improvement in communication with Samuel Morse, Morse Code. All of you are now excellent. Excellent telegraphers, I know that, and you're on your way to getting your ham radio license. All right, we also talked about cotton, slavery, and the old cell. Interesting period of time and a tragic period of time. As we mentioned before, uh, not very many Southerners were actually slave owners. In fact, the numbers, oh, I don't know, uh, probably certainly less than 25 percent, but probably more accurately less than 10 percent. Most Southerners referred to themselves as plain folks, and the institution of slavery was called the peculiar institution. You need to recognize that. All right, and we also mentioned about the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman. And I think we closed out the lecture with that of the Slave Rebellion in 1831 with Nat Turner, in which 57 people, maybe even more than that, were summarily executed and bludgeoned to death, chopped to pieces with hatchets. All right, I want to move into Chapter 12. Chapter 12 deals with reform. We're going to make America a better flat place here. Uh, my friends. And let me just share with you a quotation. This is from an Englishman, and this Englishman's name was Sidney Smith. And he made this statement here in the 1800s that uh, something to the effect like, whoever looks at an American piece of art, whoever studies an American statue or studies American architecture or reads an American book here. And the answer to that, quite painfully, there was no one that did so. And American intellectuals were very well aware uh, that we needed some cultural improvements in this respect here. So anyway, let's go back to my camera here, folks, and we'll pick up our lecture here. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this uh, chapter 12. We're going to deal with an age of reform. This age of reform means we're going to make America a better place. All right. So anyway, and one of the first advances, advancements that will take place here is the uh, creation of what was called the Hudson River School. I didn't write this out for you, but the Hudson River School, which was for aspiring artists. So we're on our way with this. And likewise, we're going to see uh, the beginning of some of our writers. I've talked to you about Washington Irving at an earlier time. I'm not trying to make a, a literature experts or English experts out of any of you good folks here. Sometimes I feel like I missed my calling. I did when I got out of the Army in 1972. The only job I could get was as an English instructor. And I taught English for half semester. I taught English for half a year for one semester. And I very much enjoyed it, too. And, you know, and, uh, even though I was a bio and a chemist. I wasn't a historian at that time. You know, I almost pursued, you know, another degree and get that, got that degree in English and particularly English composition. I encouraged my daughter to do so, and she did. She got a couple of degrees in English, and some of you may know her. Miss Barber, some of you may have had her classes under her. But I have talked to you about Washington Irving before, The Legend of Sleepy Holler, uh, Rip Van Winkle, Tales of the Alhambra, and it's all good stories here. But uh, that was about the best we could do during that period of time. But we're going to see some other Artists, or excuse me, other authors to emerge. Uh, it's been a long time since I read James Fenimore Cooper when I was much younger than I am today. When I was a, a boy of about uh, 10, 12 years of age, I read all of James Fenimore Cooper's books here. Uh, the Last of the Mohicans, some of you probably are familiar with that, you know, Leather Stocking Tales and Natty Bumpo. Uh, always, always good reading here, and I probably need to get back into that. And let's see who else we had here that were good writers at that time. I don't have anything here with... Uh, a book here from Herman Melville, but some of you probably are well familiar with his writings here. His writings, The Great White Whale, was sometimes referred to as Moby Dick. Uh, T.P., Omu, Billy Bud happened to be some of the others with that. And let's see who else we had in that period of time here. And let's see here. I didn't, oh, here I did. I wrote it down here, and I skipped right over in Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman with Leaves of Grass. Uh, here's a likeness up here of Walt Whitman there. And I, I like his writings very, very much. I'm going to take a page out of your textbook here, folks, and thrust it, if you will, under the uh, camera. And, and you can see a title page there of Leaves of Grass here. Uh, oh, Captain, my Captain, one of my favorite, favorite poems 
and you know from uh, well, equipment all right we'll move on down beyond herman melville if you will and another writer that you're probably well familiar with is a writer by the name of edgar Allan poe and i really don't know what was going on upstairs if you understand what i'm talking about in the mind of edgar Allan poe i love his writings i could read and have read almost everything that edgar Allan poe has written and a fascinating writer about the uh, about the macabre, so to speak, here. And I share a couple of photographs. I've got a lot of visuals for you good folks today. We look up in the corner right here. This is uh, the home in Baltimore of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, you can see that there's a street person that's sitting on the front porch there. It's in a dangerous area of Baltimore. A lot of Baltimore is, is uh, you're putting your life in your own hands if you want to drive there. And in fact, I don't recommend that you do that. I took this photograph early, early one morning for the crowd got out and uh, there's a confrontation that's taking place with a street person and the street person is telling me you know you're not going to take the photograph and I said I'm not taking your photograph I'm taking a photograph of the house and anyway and it was it was not a real pleasant experience with that uh, not very far from there probably a half a mile away if I can get the contrast right on this uh, let's see here you can see there's a cemetery in Baltimore uh, the cemetery is in the old section of town not very far from John Hopkins University uh, uh, it's a wall cemetery, only about a half an acre in size there. But that's where you'll find the, uh, the resting place to uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, don't be surprised when you go there that you'll find all sorts of brandy bottles or liquor bottles, you know, placed upon the, uh, uh, on, on the stone there. Uh, apparently, Edgar Allan Poe had a, a, a several types of addictive problems here, alcohol-related. Uh, it was one of those anyway. But that, it's got kind of a fun place to visit if you want to do that. Okay, let's see what else we have here. We have the Transcendentalist. This Transcendentalist. And I'm looking around for a photograph here, and I can't seem to find it here, folks. But one of the individuals, and I, I, I'm not... I'm not really into Ralph Waldo Emerson much, but he wrote Nature, and I'm trying to find this photograph, and it has eluded me here, folks. So I guess, uh, here it is. I missed out on it, so let me try to show you a likeness here of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Here he is right here. He's one of the transcend transcendentalists. Uh, he had his home up in Concord, Massachusetts. And here's what his home looks like. Uh, you'll have to pay a fee to go inside that home. Or actually, I didn't say it quite right. Take a tour of the home. You'll have to pay a fee for that. But if you walk in the front door and go into the one of the rooms there, there's a visitor center. And uh, to just uh, take a quick look around. You, and you can do all that for free, and you don't have to buy the ticket for that. All right. And if you go behind the home there, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you can find a reconstructed cabin there of his counterpart at that time, understudy, so to speak. Henry David Thoreau, and I love Henry David Thoreau. He's one of my favorite writers, and I'm going to tell you folks, I have read much, 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 and uh, anyway, uh, one of the top ten books that I have read read on uh, from uh, of all times, of all authors, was that of uh, Walden. I'll show a copy of it to you right here. It's by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, there actually is a Walden, a Walden Pond. It's about a Oh, I'd say three miles at the very most from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's home. And like I said, Henry David Thoreau was kind of an understudy to uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. But if you go there today, and and by the way, reading through that book, it's a, it's a tough read here, class, I am telling you. But it's a, a very insightful, I think, anyway. You see a likeness there of Henry David Thoreau, a uh, great thinker, but just uh, he wanted to remove himself from society for a period of time, and he went out into the woods, which was literally Walden Pond, into the woods, and that's where he lived, just hermit-like, you know, for a couple of years there. And you can actually go out to uh, Walden Pond if you wish to do so. There's a trail that uh, makes a succumb conference of the pond which is a, it's a lake it's a large lake it's not quite as large as our walker county lake but you know unless it is rather large but you can walk the trails or if you feel so inclined to do so you can even run the trails and you can find the site where henry uh, where uh, henry david thoreau's cabin was the cabin is no longer there as i said a few seconds ago probably a couple of times the reconstructed cabin is up in the uh, back area of where uh, ralph Waldo emerson's property is located today not very far away here but, but it's a fascinating story if you wish to read that too he also wrote uh, resistance to civil government in 1849 and let's see who else we might have here uh, nathaniel hawthorne 
uh, one of my favorite writers. I love his writings here. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Salem, Massachusetts, you can go to uh, uh, go up to the House of the Seven Gables, which is which is kind of interesting uh, to visit there too. If you do what I said earlier, you know, don't buy your ticket. Just walk into the guest house, guest area, and you can kind of see a part of the house with no cost whatsoever. Uh, Margaret Fuller was another individual. If you're thumbing through your textbook pages here, you'll see a likeness of her. Uh, women in the 19th century, she was uh, known for. I, I have not read the works here of Margaret Fuller. Uh, when I was much younger than I am today, uh, it was a popular read with the writings here, Louisa May Alcott, Little Men, Little Women, uh, Joe's Boys, I believe was the name of it. And if you go to the same place we keep talking about on Concord, Massachusetts, you can actually find a home there of Louisa May Alcott. I don't need to tell you how to do it for free here, folks, if you don't feel like buying the, the ticket to take a tour of the house. And anyway, and I want to add something to this. Let's see if I can get this article to fit under here. And notice the title to this uh, newspaper article. It says, Writer's Graveyard. Thoreau, Emerson, and Hawthorne, and Louisa May Alcott are all buried in the same cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, this is where uh, Louise May Alcott's home was, where Henry David Thoreau uh, had lived or spent time, Ralph Waldo Emerson, same thing there. And if you go up to this cemetery, which is right above the North Bridge I told you about earlier, where the British had their first clash, uh, or actually second clash, you know, with the Patriots, the Minutemen here, it's just right above that bridge there. And if you go up to the cemetery, the cemetery, the title of the cemetery, Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. I mean, how appropriate is that? And there, you can just walk literally step to step to step to step over over the four graves of four of America's greatest authors of that time. And it's a neat, neat place to visit here, too. All right, so anyway, that uh, let's get back on track here, folks. And we also had, in this attempt to make America a better place, we had a group which were known as the Communitarians. And if you look at the name here, Communitarians, these are people that live together. I tell my classes face-to-face, uh, -face, it's, it's like the... the the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s hippies. And these were just people that, that uh, lived in communes. They lived together. Uh, some of the interesting ones here, the Oneida community. And the Oneida community. All members were married to each other. All members in the Oneida community were married to each other. Don't for a second think that this is a free love society because sexual behavior is very closely monitored here in the Oneida community. All right, we also had another group, and this group was known as the Shakers, and the Shakers, that's what they were referred to as, and it was kind of an unusual group, they would live in communities, they were called Shaker communities, and uh, they lived lives of celibacy, lives of celibacy, uh, let's see here, I'm thumbing through an article, and I'm going to show you a couple of photographs here out of this article. Uh, quite religious group here, believe that God was neither male or female, but people that live together uh, in a commune here, and when they have their church services, and here's a photograph of a church service uh, uh, currently now. Uh, I know of no Shaker communities in the South, but there are some Shaker communities in the North. But during the uh, worship service, the men are on one side, the women are on the opposite side. Then they stand and face each other and do a loud chant and then literally shake themselves free of sin. Uh, hence, we get the name uh, Shakers. Like I said earlier, they live lives of complete celibacy. And let's see here, I think I have a photograph here showing you some shaker children uh, here we are shaker children and I know you're sitting there nodding your head and shaking your head saying well, where did the children come from if you live lives of celibacy and these children are adopted and for the shakers they make very very wonderful furniture shaker furniture and it is quite expensive all right let's continue with the communitarians and I want to introduce you to this to a person here let me see if I can find a likeness of him here, and I'm not going to show you his name yet, but uh, here is what he looked like here. He was born in the year 1799, so this was a year before the, uh, the Second Great Awakening. So when he was born, he was actually born into the Second Great Awakening, where there was this huge revival taking place in America. So in his early years, you know, he becomes a quite religious individual. Uh, if you don't know who I'm talking about with this, this individual, this person's name is Joseph Smith. All right, Joseph Smith. 
So let's move on a few years to 1823. So Joseph Smith would have been 24 years of age at that time. And he was treasure hunting. And this is near Rochester, New York. It's in up, upstate New York. And he was actually at a place which was called Palmyra. That's where he lived in Palmyra. And he was walking in the hills looking for a treasure. And I can't explain to you how he was doing that, you know, because we did not have metal detectors or anything like that. And when he was walking there, an angel of God appeared to him. And this angel of God was Moroni. And Moroni uh, showed Joseph Smith a set of golden tablets. And these golden tablets who had been written by an ancient prophet or ancient prophet by the name of Mormon. And Joseph Smith assembled this Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon. And it's going to become another religion. And this religion is referred to as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right, so it's an interesting story with that. Joseph Smith is recognized as the prophet. All right, so it was a somewhat uh, a popular religion here. Uh, they went to, I'll leave that word up so you can see this. Uh, they went to the area of Missouri and they were ousted from Missouri, back to Ohio. They were ousted from Ohio. They were moved away because their religious practices were, uh, parts of religious practices were considered to be uh, uh, offensive to basic American values. And what they were doing was they, were, had, they had to practice it was permissible to have polygamy. Now, I would ask now in class, uh, somebody give me an idea to define polygamy. And what it actually is, is many, many partners with that, or you're married to many partners. And that was just not acceptable to many people. And so nonetheless here, folks, Joseph Smith and his followers, uh, did I write this out? And I did not. They made their way into Illinois. And when they went into Illinois, they established a community there, which was called Nauvoo. And I, I don't laugh about that. They established this community, which was known as Nauvoo. It rivaled the size of Chicago. Chicago was very small at that time. But it was a, a, a thriving community. They had their own military. Uh, if you translate the word Nauvoo from Hebrew, it means beautiful. I don't know. Last time I was in Nauvoo, I, I, maybe I missed something when I was up there anyway. But no, and, and, and anyway, an angry mob cornered Joseph Smith and they uh, uh, took him into custody. This was in Carthage, uh, Illinois. You can go to that place if you wish to do so here. And uh, yeah, I wrote it out for you here. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, an angry mob uh, broke into the jail cell that uh, that that Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram being kept in, and they, they, they took the lives of Joseph Smith and his brother. All right, now the story's not over because the Mormons now who have been persecuted for their ways will now leave. There's about 12,000, maybe 15,000 of them, and they're going to make their way across the country here and go to the area of where Salt Lake City is. This is out of the United States now. It's out of the United States, and here they created another country called Desert. Desert. I'm going to go back to my camera here see if I can outline this for you folks and let me get out of your way here and where they actually went they left from this area of Illinois and made their way across like this all the way across here and out of the United States and this is out of the United States and made their way over to where Salt Lake City is located today and that's where they set up their own country uh, Desert. All right, and that's kind of interesting. And if you go to Salt Lake City, and I like Salt Lake City, it's a beautiful place to visit. You can uh, go by the Mormon Tabernacle if you wish to do so. And uh, just uh, it's very scenic. Uh, Salt Lake City itself is scenic. The nearby Salt Lakes, Great Salt Lakes, are too, and all surrounded by these huge mountains too. It's a neat, neat place to visit. Let's go back to our camera. All righty here. So let me get some things adjusted here. All right, so uh, Brigham Young will be the next leader. Let me see if I can show this to you folks here. Uh, here's uh, kind of gives you a brief history of Brigham Young and also Mormon, the Mormons and Joseph Smith. And you can see a number of wives, and these are wives here, you know, that are wives of Brigham Young. Let's see if I have Brigham Young. Here he is. Here's a likeness of Brigham Young over here and a story about Joseph Smith which is over there. Okay, but anyway, that, that's it. So that was a uh, another group here that uh, falls into the, the group that we call the Communitarians. Okay, let's move on. We're trying to make America a better place here, folks. We honestly are. 
And I'm going to move over a couple of pages in my textbook. And I will tell you folks that America had a drinking problem. It had an alcohol consumption problem. You know, we didn't have uh, uh, sports as we recognize today. Uh, you didn't have television, of course. You didn't have radio. So what the men would do, the men would gather at saloons and they would drink. And that, that was just the fashionable thing for them to do. The average male in those days drank four ounces of hard whiskey. I'm talking about hard whiskey, not mixed drinks, every day. The average American in those days drank three times as much alcohol as the average American today. They don't know my friends, however. All right, so we have a drinking problem within the country. And so anyway, we're going to see some, several groups that are going to form. Uh, first, we had the Washington Temperance Society. This was in the late 1820s. Uh, the American Temperance Union here, and all working to uh, stem the consumption of alcoholic beverages. All right, here I made those statements here about four ounces of hard liquor a day, three times as much alcohol consumption then as today. Okay, so uh, anyway, I want to share something with you, and I, and I like this. this is a good story here. Here's what happens to you here, folks, and this may be a little bit challenging for me to read, but if you're following in your textbook here, uh, where I want you to start is right over here, and it tells you here, this is, this is a drunkard's progress, by the way, and it tells you here uh, a glass to keep the cold out. And then we take the second step here. This is after you take the first step of alcohol consumption. Then we take uh, the second step here. Uh, that's a glass to keep the cold out. Uh, we go up to the third step here, which is a glass too much. And a fourth step here, drunk and riotous. And we move up to the top right here, the uh, apex here, uh, in which you are a confirmed drunkard. And now we begin to go into the abyss as we go down here. Uh, I think I said something like poverty and despair, uh, forsaken by friends, a uh, what uh, confirmed drunkard or something on that order right there. And then the final step in the drunkard's progress here is death by suicide. You see what happens here, folks? You take the first step, and once you take the first step over here, then you're on your way to being a confirmed alcoholic, and finally it's death by suicide. Suicide. And of course, this was a propaganda tactics that was used by, used by these reformed groups during that time. But here's a sad story. Look under the bridge. And if we look under the bridge here, that's the true story. Now we have the divorced wife, or if not divorced wife, we have the widow, and you have the child here that has no father here. So it's the broken family. Well, did it work? Actually, it did work. And actually, it did work. And men began to drink less hard liquor. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think I can explain that. If you remember the other day, I told you about immigrants coming into our country. Where were these immigrants coming from? They were coming from Germany. They were coming from Ireland. Both places, big beer drinkers. So what happens here, we get all these immigrants coming into our country, and people, by and large, start moving away from the consumption of hard alcohol, and they start consuming more beer here. Maybe I'm reading a little bit into this, but I really don't think that I'm doing so. We will continue this struggle here, folks, with alcoholism, and we'll continue this all the way until next semester, in which we're going to make the United States of America a dry place here in this noble experiment. All right, let's go back to our camera here, folks. And let's see what's happening here. Also, in 1830s, 1840s, we had several cholera plagues to take place, cholera epidemics to take place in our country. And St. Louis happened to be one of those anyway. Uh, we also had others to take place in New Orleans. And here's a, a uh, photograph here that took some point in New Orleans. And let's see, it's called the Old Mortuary Chapel in New Orleans. And I uh, think in New Orleans it had like a 25% loss in population here, you know, from plague. Uh, here's a historical marker there. The Old Mortuary Chapel in 1826 is a burial church for victims of yellow fever, plague, and other things of that nature. All right, so those were two things that we also had to deal with in that period. Now, uh, let me tell you, too, 
that during this period, if we remember Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson had advocated a crusade against ignorance uh, and the Republican mother and so forth. But you know something, by 1831, we did not have a single comprehensive educational system in this country. And so I'm going to flip back here and let you see a name here of a person by the name of Horace Mann. He was the first uh, Secretary of the Board of Education in Massachusetts. And here we're going to see the beginning of an academic school year of six months. All right, wouldn't that be great for us today? You know, only have an academic school year of six months. I don't think it would be in our best interest to do that. But this is a start. This is just a start. Okay, let's move on here. Remember now, we are trying to make America a better place. Now, I want to tell you that up until this time, in the 1830s anyway, all perpetrators of crime, I don't care whether you were a pickpocket or whether you were a rapist and arsonist and a murderer, if you committed a, a, a crime, you were placed in a, an incarceration facility where everybody else was. It did not make a difference on the type of crime it was. And even people that were mentally ill during this time, you were thrown into a, a, an incarceration place here. So that was not right. So we need to improve upon that. And so one lady, in a later time I'll show you a likeness of her. Maybe I'll have a likeness of her in just a few minutes here. And, uh, and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. But came up with the idea of a establishing asylum. Now, asylums, if you want to pluralize it in that direction here. All right, so asylum. And this means that we could establish facilities here for those people that had a mental retardation or mental illness here or mentally handicapped, and they could be best kept and away from where these hardened criminals were here. So we see the asylum movement to begin here, largely led by this mover and shaker, Dorothea Dix here. I hate to use words such as this because I'm, I'm kind of sensitive about things like this, but it was a title that they used at that time. And even in, in my early times, too, they referred to them as insane asylums. You kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. All right, another thing we're going to see here is the emergence of penitentiaries. Penitentiaries is going to come out during this period of time here, folks. The first one was that in Auburn, and this was in uh, 1819, I believe it was anyway. That's Auburn, New York, not Auburn, Alabama. Sing Sing in New York was uh, 1825. We had other penitentiaries, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And at first it would be so terribly different than what we would have, what we're, we would see today. At first prisoners were not allowed to communicate with each other. You could not speak at all. Uh, you were chained so that you had to walk in lockstep. Everybody takes the left foot uh, together. Everybody shifts to the right foot together and so forth with that. So anyway, again, it is just movement in a uh, better direction here, folks. Of course, if we try to do that today, to not let prisoners speak or have them to march in lockstep, you know, you would have federal suits brought against you uh, to, to prevent you from doing that. All right, so let's move on as we continue here. Now, we're likewise going to see an age of feminism, age of feminism, in which women are going to demand more rights. And it was a popular saying here at that time, all men and women are created equal. Two of the ladies that were uh, movers and shakers in this, Sarah and Angelina Grimke. I do not have likeness of either one of those individuals. But here are some other ladies here associated with this. Uh, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, which is, nope, I don't see Susan B. Anthony here. I don't see her on here. Uh, but anyway, you'll see several photographs of Susan B. Anthony in the future here. Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, who is here. Lucretia Mott, we'll talk about her at a later time, too. Dorothea Dix, a lady I mentioned to you a few minutes ago here, associated with the, uh, the asylum movement here. Uh, these two ladies here, uh, Amelia Bloomer, Stanton Amelia Bloomer here, wearing their bloomers, by the way. But anyway, it was an age of feminism. Okay, so let's uh, move on here because we still have a little bit of ground to cover today. Now, we're going to see also in the 18, 1820s more and more of a voice for abolition. Now, if you don't understand the word I'm talking about here, abolition is to abolish slavery. Abolition to abolish slavery. And by the 1820s, 1830s, the abolitionist movement began to gain momentum. Here. And, of course, in the South, there was a lot of opposition to this. But uh, there had even been an effort to return slaves back to Africa. And several boatloads of, 
uh, slaves were placed on ships and sent back to Africa. They went into an area and landed off of the uh, West African coastline. And, uh, and uh, crazily enough, it, when they, when they landed there, they were they were treated like invaders. And the the people that are Africans there tried to force this group away, you know, because it appeared as if they were were invaders. But they established this area, which is called Liberia. We have this country, Liberia today. Liberty, Liberty, with its capital city of Monrovia. Monrovia. I wonder who that's named for. And I bet you can figure it out. It is James Monroe here. Okay, so the abolition movement is going to gain a little bit of momentum here, folks. One of the uh, guys that's going to be so instrumental into this is a white man. And this person's name is Wynne Lloyd Garrison. If you thumb through your textbook, you see a likeness there of William Lloyd Garrison. And uh, I, in fact, I'll just show you a likeness here. Here he is right here, William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, he is a white man uh, he's from Massachusetts, had an abhorrence against slavery. And in fact, he was the uh, editor of a newspaper in Boston, which was called The Liberator. And I'll share a couple of quotations with you from William Lloyd Garrison. And uh, first of all, he demanded the immediate and unconditional and universal abolition of slavery. And he wanted to extend the rights of citizenship to all blacks. Here's a quotation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. And I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. That was William Lloyd Garrison. And William Lloyd Garrison, you need to recognize the name here, folks, established the uh, New England Anti-Slavery Society. And in the years to come, this New England Anti-Slavery Society would gain a membership of over 250,000 members. Now, William Lloyd Garrison, he was a different guy. He meant well, but he was a different individual. On one occasion here, he had to be placed in jail for his own protection because he was going to be strung up and, 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 and hanged with that. But he was against the government. He wanted full equality for women, which I have no problem with whatsoever. He was an extreme pacifist. In fact, he did not believe in any type of military whatsoever. We should not even participate in defensive wars. He was against asylum which in my estimation, the asylums are, are positive with that. But his view on this, that if you place somebody in asylum, this was coercion, you were placing them in, in the asylum against their will. And he wanted the North to separate from the South. Not the South to separate from the North, the North to separate from the South. So William Lloyd Garrison, he, he, he was a different individual. All right, now I want to share with you uh, a... Uh, Another individual here, Frederick Douglass. Let me show you a likeness here, Frederick Douglass. I've always liked Frederick Douglass. Here he is right here. Up there. This is an uh, elderly photograph of him, or a photograph when he was older. Uh, by the way, here's Harriet Tubman down here, if you're curious about that. But uh, here, I'll just keep this up here about it, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass had an interesting life. I'm trying to locate here something for you folks here. Uh, it, this is kind of fun to read here. You can see how thick it is, which it is not very thick at all. But it's known as the uh, narrative of life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass was born in Maryland, Talbot County, Maryland. You can visit there today. Some of the historical signs that are present there will lead you to believe that uh, his home is still there and it is not still there. Uh, it's Frederick Douglass, who was born as Frederick Bailey. Uh, did not really know what his birth date was. He just knew, you know, kind of when his birth date was. And uh, anyway, here's another likeness here of uh, Frederick Douglass. Let's see what else I have. Here's a brochure that came from Talbert County, uh, Maryland, about Frederick Douglass. All right. And he was a runaway slave. Well, by the way, he was taught to read and write, and this was against Maryland laws at that time. But the, uh, the, the master's wife taught him to read and write. He's mixed race, by the way. He is, uh, he, his, his father was white, his mother was black. But he ran away at an early age and uh, actually, and I don't know how he did this, made his way to England and was a very gifted speaker. And so he got on a lecture tour there and made some money and returned to the United States and purchased his freedom for $600. And later went into uh, uh, Rochester, New York and established a uh, newspaper, which was called the uh, North Star. And for Frederick Douglass, he not only wanted freedom, but he wanted full and uh, full and economic equality, and for African Americans. 
Today, if you visit in Washington, D.C., and this is run by the National Park Service, by the way, but uh, take the uh, metro system and, and be careful when you do this now, and cross the Anacostia River and go over to the area of Anacostia and then walk up to uh, uh, Cedar Hill, Cedar Hill, which is the home of Frederick Douglass. Like I said, it's run by the National Park Service today. Uh, you have to make your own decision on whether you want to do that, but it, it is a kind of interesting place to, to visit for that. All right, so that kind of drives us through here with uh, this part of the lecture. Let me just get started a little bit into our next section here, folks, and we'll move into our next chapter, and it is a big, big chapter, by the way. And America is moving west. The uh, population of the United States has quadrupled, if you will, here from uh, 1803 to 1850. Uh, Horace Greeley, a famous uh, uh, newspaper man, made the statement here, go west, young man, go west. And if we stop and we think about this, by going west, by going west, we're going to be entering into new lands here, folks. Now, even though we say that the United States, the United States owns all that is east of the Mississippi River, all of this area over here, or really over in this area here, I should not have said east of the Mississippi River because we do have Louisiana Purchase there, but all of this area over here, this is not owned by the United States. It's actually owned by Spain. So how can the United States justify moving to the West and taking the land of the Native American or taking the land that belongs to uh, Spain or subsequently Mexico with that? Well, the idea behind this, it is our God-given right to do so. This is manifest destiny. America is destined by God and by history to spread its territorial boundaries from coast to coast. And as I mentioned to you the other day, and I'm going to go back here so you see the word, we made use of the penny press. And we talked about that the other day, bold sensationalistic headlines designed to sell the newspaper here. But all of these newspapers at that time were advocating, go west, go west. It is our God-given right to be able to do so here. But how was slavery factor into this? Well, we'll see about that in just a little bit. Not today, but right down the road and the next time that we get together. But Americans were deeply, deeply interested in returning to Texas. And remember, we had given up all territorial claims to Texas with the Adams Honest Treaty. All right, thank you for your attention here, folks.